All right, hello everybody. Uh, this video is going to cover the solution guide to the second practice exam for the second exam. Um, so if you haven't already, I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you try this exam on your own uh, under exam conditions. So give yourself some time, give yourself some notes, don't consult other people, try it out, see how you do. And then uh, once you've given it your best shot, take a look at this video and check out the solution and see if your solution is similar to mine. Okay, so uh, one disclaimer that's written here, this practice exam is definitely not comprehensive. It has a smattering of problems from the sections between exam one and exam two, um, but there's definitely topics that don't get hit on this practice exam. It's not meant to serve as your only preparation for uh, the exam. If you wanna prepare, I recommend that you use this practice exam in conjunction with practice problems, looking over old homeworks, studying from the book, coming to office hours, going to the SI sessions, and etc. Okay, I think that's all I want to say about that. So we'll go ahead and jump in on question number one. So question number one is a standard derivative rule problem. Uh, we are given a function and we're asked to explain which rules we're going to need to do the derivative of this function, and then they're gonna ask us to actually do the function. Okay, so uh, first of all, I can see that I am subtracting here. I'm subtracting which means that I think that we're, first of all, we're gonna use the, we're gonna use the difference rule. And the reasoning is we are subtracting functions. I think we're gonna to need to use a multiplication by constant rule. Uh, why do I need to use the multiplication by constant function? I see two constants that are being multiplied. First of all, there's this three here, and there's also this three here. We can think of that as being a one-third multiplier, okay? Dividing by three is the same as multiplying by one-third. So I'll write uh, first and third terms have um, constant multipliers. Okay, what other rules? We're gonna to need to use the power rule. Uh, Self-explanatory, uh, x to the ninth is a non-zero power of x. That's when we are supposed to use the power rule. Uh, we're also going to need to use the ln rule because there's an ln. We're also going to need to use the a to the x rule. We're going to need to use the a to the x rule because we have 2 to the 4x is present. Um, lastly, I think we're going to need to use the chain rule. First of all, because ln of 23x is a composition of functions. Um, and I also think that 2 to the 4x can also be um, <clears throat> can also be considered a composition of functions, although we don't have to consider it that way. 
Okay, so I think those are all of the rules that we're going to have to use. So let's go ahead and use them to actually find the derivative. Well, I think the first part is going to go fairly smoothly. 3x to the power 9, we're just going to use the power rule. So I'll write 9 times 3x to the power 8. And now the second part, I'm going to need to use the chain rule. As I said, the first thing I need to do is identify that the inside function is 23x and the outside function is the natural log. So to find the derivative, I should use the chain rule. That means I should do 1 over the original function, 23x, and then I should chain rule out and multiply by the derivative of 23x which is just 23. Now I should subtract. Now there's two roots that I could go here. I could try to use the a to the x rule uh, in conjunction with chain rule to find this derivative of this 2 to the 4x thing. But I'm going to do something a little bit more clever. I'm going to do something a little bit more clever. Here's what I'm going to do. First of all, I'm going to pull that 1 third out front it's just going to come along for the ride. And now I'm going to write, let me find some margin, margin area here and explain what I'm about to do. I'm going to write 2 to the power 4x as 2 to the power 4 to the power x, 2 to the power 4 to the power x. And now I can rewrite what's on the inside of this as just 16 to the power x. So what I'm going to write here should be the derivative of 16 to the power x. So let's clean this up a little bit. We get 27x to the power 8 minus those 23s can cancel. I'll get just 1 over x. And I'll have minus 1 third times the derivative of 16 to the x should be 16 to the x times ln of 16. Great. Okay, so um, we can clean it up a little bit more if we wanted to simplify it. This would be a correct answer already, but uh, let's simplify it a little bit more. Like this. That looks nicer. Okay, so those are the rules that we used to do this derivative, and this is how we would actually do the derivative. Okay, so question two we have a population of wolves in Yellowstone, and it is modeled by a complicated function f of x, where x is the rabbit population of Yellowstone. So we don't know anything about the function, but we have two key pieces of information. The pieces of information are, we know that right now there's 20 wolves and 100 rabbits, and we know that f prime <clears throat> of 100 uh, is equal to 0 0.2. So first of all, I'm going to take a look at this first piece of information. This is just trying to hide or obscure a more mathematical phrase. So the mathematical phrase we could use to write this would be f of 100, because there's 100 rabbits, is equal to 20. Because remember, the function f describes the population of wolves. 
So we have f of 100 equals 20 and f prime of 100 equals 0 0.2. <clears throat> So we want to write down a strategy for estimating the wolf population if additional rabbits are introduced to the park by rangers. Now, remember, we have no information about the actual function f of x, which means that when we're estimating here, maybe another word we could use for estimation would be approximation. And I hope that when you hear the word approximation, the first thing that comes into your mind is the tangent line equation. So we know that the tangent line will approximate our function, and the only thing we need to know for the tangent line is the value of f at that point and the value of the derivative of f at that point. And if we know those two things, we can do the tangent line approximation. Okay, so let's write down a strategy. Uh, we can estimate the population using tangent line approximation. We know that f of x will be approximately equal to t of x, where t of x is equal to f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. For our particular situation, we know that <coughs> a should be a value of our uh, independent variable, which in our case is the rabbit population. So A is going to be 100. So F of 100 plus F prime of 100 times X minus 100, which is again going to be equal to, we're just going to plug in 20 for f of 100, plus 0 0.2 times x minus 100. So this is my strategy. I'm going to use tangent line approximation because I don't have my hands on the actual function f. Okay, so now we want to use our strategy to estimate the wolf population if five additional rabbits are introduced to the park by rangers. Okay, so this is an example of a word problem that's trying to sort of confuse us by the way they give us information. They say five additional rabbits are introduced. If we, have, if we initially have a hundred rabbits, that's right here, we initially have a hundred rabbits, then introducing five additional rabbits will cause the new rabbit population to be 105. So x is going to be equal to 105. And if we want to know the wolf population when the rabbit population is 105, what we want to know is what is f of 105. We don't have a good hands-on definition for what f is, but we can use the tangent line approximation. It will be equal to 20 plus 0 0.2 times, now for x I'm going to put the new population, that's 105, and from 105 I will subtract 100, and this is going to get me 20 plus 1 which is 21 wolves. Okay, uh, I just want to reiterate that this is an estimation, okay? It's not going to be, in fact, I wrote the wrong thing here where I put an equal sign. What I should have written instead is 
little squigglies, okay? Because it's going to be approximately equal to 21 walls. Okay. So now we want to use the strategy in part A to estimate the wolf population if 30 additional rabbits are introduced to the park by rangers. Well, that just means that x is going to be equal to 130, and f of 130 will be approximately equal to 20 plus 0 0.2 times, now I'm going to replace x by 130, minus, uh, um, minus 100. <clears throat> So this will be equal to 20 plus, well that'll be 30, divide by 5 we get 6, so 20 plus 6 equals 26 wolves. Okay. So we've done A, B, and C, and now all that there's left to do is to decide whether we think our estimate in part B <coughs> is better or whether we think our estimate in part C is better. The answer is going to be that the estimate in part B is more reliable. Okay? Let me write down our answer and I'll explain why. So the estimate in B is likely more accurate since tangent line approximation is only accurate for x values close to x equals a. So to describe what I'm talking about, I'll draw a graph. Perhaps the population looks something like this. Mm, let's not draw that, let's draw it like this. And if here's 20, no, that would be 100 rabbits. Here's 100 rabbits. We have 20 wolves. What are we doing here? What we're doing is we're taking this point here, we're taking the slope, and we're just making a line like this. So if I want to say that the red line is very close to the blue curve and so we can approximate the blue curve by the red line, that's great and all, but it's only going to be in a close approximation when we are relatively close to, let's see if I can get some good colors going here. When I'm relatively close to my initial point, the blue line, or the blue curve and the red line are not too far apart. However, if I expand this radius to be, say, this large, then it's possible that the red line and the blue curve are getting further and further apart. So, since 130 is further away from 100 than 105 is, we can expect that the estimate for the wolf population when 5 rabbits is introduced is better than when we introduce 30 rabbits. Introducing a lot of rabbits may cause a uh, non-uniform change in our wolf population because we don't really know what the curve of F actually looks like. Okay, so that was question number two. Move on to question number three. When producing 500 units, a business analyst computes their company's marginal profit as pi prime of 500 equals to $1,000. Should the company produce more or less goods 
assuming that the company wants to maximize profits. Well, my MacBook just went to sleep. I hope this is still going. Okay. Uh, let's see, where was I? So pi prime of 500 equals to 1000. What is that telling us? Well, it's telling us very little. But if we were going to graph our profit function, what we know is that if we go to 500 units and we're making some amount of profit, we don't know how much profit, what pi prime of 500 is telling me is that the tangent line has slope 1000. So the question of whether I should produce more items is, should I iterate myself from 500 and keep going to the right and produce more and more items? And the answer is, yes, I absolutely should because moving to the right is going to cause my profits to increase. So since the profit function has a positive rate of change, I should go ahead and produce more items so that I can make more profit. So the company should produce more units because pi prime of q is larger than zero implies profit will increase with production. Great. All right, speaking in terms of the marginal profit, under what conditions will profit be maximized? So, I'm just going to draw an example curve here. Maybe profit looks something like this. So here's pi of q. This isn't necessarily the profit function in part a, it's just a profit function. And I'm drawing it to try to illustrate, well, we want to know, speaking in terms of the marginal profit, in other words, pi prime of q, under what conditions will profit be maximized? Well, profit is going to be maximized when we go as high as possible. So if we draw in our tangent line here, the amazing thing that we see is that the tangent line will be horizontal. And the slope of this tangent line is exactly pi prime of q. And this is one scenario. However, our profit function could look a bit different. For example, it could look like this. If it looks like this, we don't necessarily have a unique tangent line. It could be this line, or it could be this line. My point being that we want to describe what should happen to pi prime of q when profit is maximized. And the answer is that profit will be maximized at a critical point. Profit will be maximized at a critical point. Now, not all critical points are local maxes. However, all local maxes will be critical points. So, critical points occur when pi prime of q is equal to zero or 
pi prime of q does not exist. So necessary but not sufficient condition for a local max. However, we were asked essentially what is the necessary condition on pi prime of q that will be imposed when the profit function reaches a maximum, and that is that the maximum can only occur at a critical point. Okay. So now we're given something a little bit more hands-on. They tell us the cost function and the revenue function, and we are supposed to figure out how many units should we produce to maximize profit. Okay, well, I think a good place to start would be writing down what is the profit function. It's going to be equal to the revenue function minus our cost function. And that's going to be equal to 15q plus 71 minus q squared over 2. Now, we want to maximize this. Let me rewrite it first. Negative q squared over 2 plus 15q plus 71. From part b, we know that the profit function will only be maximized when we have a critical point. So a good place to start here would be to try to find out are there any critical points for this function? And critical points are defined through the derivative of the profit function or of any function. So a good thing to do here would be to try to compute pi prime of q. Well, use the power rule on the first one. We'll get negative q plus 15. And our question is, when is this equal to zero? Okay. The reason I'm not worrying about the DNE case, by the way, is the profit function, in our case, is a polynomial. And polynomial functions, we don't need to worry about their derivatives not existing. So I'm only going to worry about when is this function, this derivative function, equal to zero. And that's going to happen when q is equal to 15. Great. So I know q equals 15 is a critical point. Now, if I wanted to say that q equals 15 corresponds to a max, I need to justify that claim. I can use one of two methods. I could use the first derivative test, or I could use the second derivative test. For this problem, I'm going to use the second derivative test because I think it's going to be pretty quick and easy that way. Let's apply second derivative test. Pi double prime of q is going to be equal to negative 1. So in particular, pi double prime of 15, like all other points, is going to be equal to negative 1. Negative 1 is a number which is less than 0, which means that the profit function is concave down at q equals 15. This implies Q equals 15 units maximizes profits. Okay, so I use the second derivative test on that one. Uh, later on, we'll do an example of a first derivative test. All right, question number four. Riley is completing a homework assignment when she comes across the question, what is the definition of a critical point? Do functions always have a local maximum at critical point? 
And so she gives it a shot and writes down the following answer. A function f has a critical point at p comma f of p whenever f prime of p is equal to zero. It is not true that every critical point is a local maximum. Some of them will be local minimums. Okay, and we're supposed to kind of evaluate this response and point out any flaws or anything that Riley missed. So this is definitely not the worst answer uh, that Riley could have given. She got a lot right. However, I don't think that her answer is complete completely correct. And here's a couple things I want to note. First of all, a function has a critical point at p comma f of p whenever f prime of p is equal to zero or f prime of p does not exist. And the last part that I want to point out is not every critical point corresponds to a local maximum or a local minimum. So I would edit this and I would say, and some of them will be neither. Okay, so let's evaluate. I agree that f prime of p equals zero implies there is a critical point. At p comma f of p. However, Riley failed to mention the other uh, the other case in which f prime of p doesn't exist. She also was right to notice not all critical points are maxes. She missed the final option, though, namely that critical points don't have to be mins or maxes. Okay, so we addressed uh, Riley's response. And so for the part that's talking about, write down how you would answer the question, I would just modify it by adding or f prime does not exist on this part up here. And then I would say, and some of them will be neither. So that's my answer to the second part of the problem. Okay, that's question four. Okay, so question five is another critical point problem. We're supposed to find all the critical points of this function. We are supposed to classify each one as a local max, a local min, or neither, uh, using the method of our choice. And then later on, we're supposed to def decide whether we think f of x has an inflection point. Okay, so let's start in on the first part. 
the first thing to recognize is that the function f of x is a polynomial function. Okay, don't get spooked by these constants being multiplied here, being wonky numbers. Okay, I know that this is a polynomial because the powers of x are all non-negative integers. Okay, so I know I don't need to worry about f prime not existing. So let's go ahead and compute f prime of x, and then we'll just need to worry about when is it zero. Well, by the power rule, I'll get well, 3 and divide by 3, cancel each other out. We'll get x squared minus 9x plus 14, and then the 73 will go away. So I just used the power rule three times, and I used the sum rule, or the difference rule, however you want to call it. And my goal is to find out when is this equal to zero. Well, it'll be equal to zero uh, when either one of its factors is equal to zero. If we multiply two numbers together and we get zero, well, one of them better be zero. So let's go ahead and factor this. I want a number which, I want two numbers which when I multiply them together, I get 14. And when I add them, I get negative nine. Those two numbers are negative seven and negative two. Since negative seven plus negative two is negative nine, negative seven times negative two is positive 14. So this is going to imply that either x is equal to seven or x is equal to two. Okay, so we have two critical points. Now we need to classify each one as a local max or a local min or neither using the method of our choice. The first method I will show will be the first derivative test. Okay, so what we should do for the first derivative test is draw a number line. On my number line, I'm gonna put my critical points, two and seven. Now I know that the critical points are the only place where the derivative is equal to zero. So I know that in each interval, in each subinterval, the derivative's not going to change sign in any of these intervals, because if it wanted to change sign, it would have to go past zero first. And there's no other places where the derivative is equal to zero other than at x equals two and x equals seven. So what I can do to figure out what sign the derivative is in each of these intervals is to choose a test point from each one. I'll choose points which are convenient to uh, compute. Uh, I'll take zero from this one. Here I'll take three, I like small numbers. And I'll take eight here for the same reason, I like small numbers. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is check what is f prime of zero. If I plug it in, I get zero minus zero plus 14. That's 14 which is larger than zero. So I'm gonna mark that on my number line. I'm larger than zero at first. Now I'm gonna do the same thing with the other test points of prime of three. Let's check what that is. Well, it'll be nine minus. Um, uh, well, a smarter way to do that would have been to plug into the, uh, yeah, okay, sorry. So nine minus 27 plus 14. Let's see, that'll be negative 23, negative 13, nine minus 13 is I think negative four. Be sure it's negative four, less than zero. Mark that on my number line, less than zero. 
Last one I want to do is f prime of uh, 8. So that's going to be 64 God, minus 72 plus 14. Should have brought a calculator with me today. This is going to be positive 6. And my laptop fell asleep. Okay. And it's happening. So this is larger than zero. We'll mark it on our thing here, larger than zero. And now we'll describe whether we think these are local mins or local maxes or neither. Well, to the left of two, our derivative is positive. That means we're traveling up. And then after that, our derivative is negative. That means we're traveling down. Well, what goes up must come down, and what happens in between has to be a max. So I think this is a max. After we pass 7, our derivative is positive again, we're moving up. I think we're going to have a min. So x equals 7 is a min for f of x. x equals 2 is a max for f of x. So that's how we use the first derivative test. Now I'll also show you how to use the second derivative test. So if we didn't want to do all that trouble, we could instead just compute what is f double prime of x. Well, it's just going to be 2x minus 9. So another derivative. If I check what is f double prime, I want to check what is f double prime at my points. I want to know what is f double prime of 2. Well, it's going to be uh, 4 minus 9 equals negative 5, which is less than 0. So if my Second derivative is less than zero, that means I'm concave down with an n like this. And this n here in the word down looks like a max to me, so I'm going to go ahead and say x equals 2 corresponds to a max. Now we'll check the other one, f double prime of 7. Well, that'll be equal to... 14 minus 9, which is 5. That one's larger than 0. If we write concave up, which remember, f double prime larger than 0 means we're concave up. And I take a look at the u here. That looks more like a minimum. So x equals 7 corresponds to a minimum. So that's another way that we could have done it. So first derivative test or second derivative test. The problem said use the method of your choice. If I was going to pick one, I think I would probably choose the second derivative because I'm pretty good at computing derivatives. And if I use that one, I have less plugging work to do. I don't like plugging because I make a lot of arithmetic errors. All right, so that's just my personal preference. If you want to use the first derivative test, go for it. OK, so now we want to figure out, does f of x have an inflection point? If so, find the point. If not, explain why it doesn't have an inflection point. Well, an inflection point is a point where our concavity changes either from being concave up to then being concave down or from being concave down to then being concave up. Well, I already used the second derivative test in the first problem, and I found that at one point our concavity was negative, and at the other point our concavity was positive, so I think there is going to be a point where our concavity changes sign. 
So let's go ahead and see if we can figure out when that happens. Well, we know that if there is an inflection point, it will occur when f double prime equals zero or f double prime does not exist. Well, since f was a polynomial, f prime is a polynomial, and since f prime is a polynomial, the derivative of a, der of a polynomial always exists, so we don't need to worry about this second part, really. Okay, we don't need to worry about this. So we're just going to focus on this other case where f prime is actually equal to zero. f double prime, excuse me. So f double prime of x was equal to, let me remind you, it was 2x minus 9. So if we want to know when is that equal to zero, we just set it equal to zero. We'll move the 9 over to the other side and we'll get x equals 9 halves or 4.5. Now. To be very rigorous, we should show that not only is the second derivative equal to 0 at 4.5, but the concavity is actually different on both sides. So let's actually show that. We'll use a number line again. We'll put 4.5 right here. And I will choose a test point from each side. From the right side, I'll choose the test point 5. From the left side, I'll choose the test point four. Um, if you use the second derivative test on the on part A, well, you could just use those two points, uh, the points two and seven. They're both on either side of four point five, so that would be fine. But let's use four and five. So what I should really do here is say f double prime of five. Well, that's going to be equal to 10 minus 9 equals 1, which is larger than 0. So I can mark larger than 0 here. Remember, in the first derivative test, this larger than 0, less than 0, larger than 0 thing, this was a description of f prime is dot dot dot, larger than 0, less than 0, greater than 0. In this concavity problem, this number line, I'm really talking about f double prime is dot dot dot. So we did five, let's do, let's check f double prime of four. Well, it'll be equal to uh, eight minus nine equals negative one, which is less than zero. So what are we saying? We're saying that our concavity was less than zero. We were concave down and then Later on, after we passed 4.5, our concavity was larger than zero. We were concave up. So if we wanted to draw, I don't know, maybe it looked something like this. All right? So this would be our point here where we have an inflection point. To the left, we're concave down. To the right, we're concave up. So to finish this problem off, I would say since f prime, f double prime changes sign at x equals 4.5, it has a critical point at 4.5 comma f of 4.5 and if I really wanted to go the extra mile I could plug 4.5 into my original function x cubed over 3 minus 9 halves x squared plus 14 x minus 73 and write that here but I don't feel like doing that okay so that's the practice exam uh, I hope that you find it instructive um, again, this is sort of to give you an idea of 
what do the questions look like? What kinds of questions am I going to ask? How am I going to ask those questions? Not so much to be an indicator of what is going to be covered on the exam itself. Although I can tell you that it's going to be real, real hard to avoid doing derivatives and doing critical point analysis. So that I think is all I have to say. Uh, if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to email me or come to office hours, do any of the things that I tell you are good for you to do all the time in class. Okay, so uh, thanks for watching.